Hey folks, George here again. Today we're going to talk about a very famous piece of Japanese literature from Nobel Prize laureate Oe Kinzaburo. The essay is entitled Japan, the Ambiguous, and Myself. I'm reading my copy of it from this edition, which is, you know, uh, Columbia University Anthology uh, of Modern Japanese Literature, Volume 2. Uh, that's just the anthology that I've got. And uh, any page numbers and things will be from that anthology. So if you want to follow along, you can. What's interesting about this piece is it's written in 1994. This is his Nobel Prize winning speech. Of course, we're always going to talk about the thesis of this essay, the characters he discusses, uh, also the setting and the themes, as well as the structure of the essay, the historical context, along with intertextual connections and my own connections to it, my own feelings about this essay. What's really interesting about it is that I think I'm going to talk a lot today about the intertextual connections because Oe is the second Japanese writer to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. The second writer. The first writer, of course, is Kawabata Yasunari. His essay to uh, commemorate his winning of the Nobel Prize is called Japan, the Beautiful, and Myself. Well, several years later, now that Oe has won the Nobel Prize for Literature, he's giving his speech and calling it Japan, the Ambiguous, and Myself. And so we'll see how Oe is kind of uh, coming to terms with Kawabata's own speech and actually trying to go beyond it and I think actually disagreeing with it and going against it in many different ways. We'll talk about that. Uh, and so for that reason, this essay uh, that we discussed today will talk a lot more about intertextual connections, specifically the intertextual connections to that earlier essay by Kawabata, uh, which I haven't given a lecture on yet or I haven't made a video on yet. So uh, I'll just have to fill in some of the gaps or will fill in some of the gaps based on Oe's essay here. Uh, perhaps in the future, I'll uh, make a video about Kawabata's own essay in 1968. Let's start with the thesis or the plot of Owe's essay here. I think his main thesis, his main point, the main thrust of what he's trying to say here is really that Japan is part of the international world. There is this global community now called humanity. And many times through this speech, Oe is trying to put forward this thesis of humanism and that the Japanese people should adopt a more humanistic approach towards uh, the world, really, right? Uh, Japan should not be isolated. Japan should participate in the global community and fight and be a part of uh, fighting for common values amongst humanity. And this humanism is going to be influenced by not Japanese literature, not Japanese literature, but other global literatures from uh, around the world, uh, a lot from Europe also. However, one character, now let's talk about the characters he discusses, one character he discusses is his old professor of French literature named Kazuo Watanabe. Kazuo Watanabe was uh, always professor at Tokyo University and taught him about the values of humanism and internationalism via French literature. I've already talked about another uh, character whom Owe engages with a lot in this essay, and that is Kawabata, the earlier uh, winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature. Another very interesting character whom uh, Owe discusses towards the end of his essay is his own son, Hikaru. One thing that's very interesting about his son and what he confesses about his son, what he reveals about his son and his experience raising his son, is that his son has autism. Now, it so happens that uh, through childhood, they uh, still raised him and educated him. And today, uh, Hikaru Oe is a musical composer, right? And so at the end here of this essay, Oe really throws in a lot of uh, beautiful ideas about how his son with autism sees the world differently. And so with that in mind, we could talk about another theme that we'll talk about a little bit later, which is this notion that 
uh, uh, special needs. How do we deal with special needs in society, right? And um, other sorts of mental issues in society. And Owe having to raise a son with autism is, I think, well uh, equipped to discuss this issue and bring it to the forefront. And this is in 1994. This is in 1994. And still today, uh, Japan and even America still wrestles with, and everywhere else in the world too, by the way, still wrestles with how do we uh, work with our people who have uh, special needs? Yes. And Owe is quite brilliant in illuminating this idea through anecdotes about his son that people with special needs merely see the world in a different way. And we probably can learn something about the way that such people see the world and process their information and also express themselves. And especially with Hikaru, his son, being a musician and translating or, or, or transmitting or expressing his feelings through music, right? And I think that's a very interesting uh, avenue that Owe goes uh, towards the end of this essay and how that different kind of perspective contributes to the grander humanist theme, the grander humanist thesis of this essay, yeah? And this is why I love, this is my personal connection with this essay. This is why I love Owe's essay. Because he challenges this notion of Japanese. What is Japanese? I really dislike this notion that there is a Japanese way of thinking. Right? Owe challenges that. He looks at one Japanese, uh, one example of, as paradigmatic example of a Japanese as can be, Kawabata, and says, uh, I think we could be a different kind of Japanese. And if that's what Japanese is, fine. I want to be a humanist, not a Japanese. After all, this Japanese notion, it's not a monolithic idea. What does it even mean? I'm not sure. Kawabata gives his thesis. Oh, I'll tell you what Japanese means. It means be like these old Zen poets. A few videos ago, I talked about Tanizaki. Tanizaki says, oh, I'll tell you what Japanese means. Ta Japanese means uh, to appreciate the darkness and subtleties of Japanese art, traditional Japanese art. And it seems to me that Owe is challenging this and saying, let me tell you what this thing called Japanese can be. Number one, Japanese, we Japanese are this ambiguous thing, both Western and Eastern, but neither, both modern and traditional, but neither really. And I wanna bring that together to make a humanism. And Oe has the courage to stand up against this beautiful, Japanese that Kawabata talks about, that Kawabata writes about. You know what's even curiouser is that Owe does take a jab to some of the younger generation too, like Haruki Murakami. And he says, you know what, I don't like these younger generation of writers who are so consumer focused and consumer based and trying to sell or mass market. I want to be a more humanistic writer. I want to be a writer that teaches lessons, that has something to say, that isn't just trying to sell a million copies. And so he challenges the very notion of Japanese and the value of talking about something called Japanese. I really admire that courage that Oe expresses there. So now that we've talked a little bit about uh, where he will go in this essay, let's talk about the intertextual connections and especially his engagement with Kawabata, whom in, uh, who in 1968 uh, won the first Japanese Nobel Prize for Literature and gave his essay called Japan the Beautiful 
and myself. Now I'll just give a quick rundown right here. Uh, this is in 1968. This is clearly after World War II. This is clearly uh, in the middle of Japan's uh, economic miracle in the late 60s. What does Kawabata's essay, Japan the Beautiful in Myself, what does it really talk about? It talks a lot about the beauty of old Japan. It's quite reminiscent, in fact, of Tanizaki's 1933 essay, In Praise of Shadows. Kawabata is really expressing these values, especially these values of Zen and poetry, and how Zen poetry and the Zen uh, uh, perspective really contributes to Japan, Japan's worldview. That's a very uh, a cursory summary. I haven't done justice to that essay, but that is a cursory summary of Kawabata's essay. Now with that in mind, let's talk about how Oe engages with that essay and challenges the ideas of Kawabata and challenges the ideas of uh, putting such a high uh, role for old Japan, right? Well, firstly, this is one way that Oe consciously goes against Kawabata's earlier essay. For one thing, in Kawabata's essay, Kawabata only references old Japanese poets and old Japanese writers from, you know, three, four, five hundred and even more years ago. Oe's essay does the exact opposite. There isn't one Japanese writer whom he references in his essay. Well, you could kind of count uh, his old professor. Kazuo Watanabe towards the end of the essay, but again, Watanabe in this context is not a uh, is not a Japanese writer, but rather a professor of French literature, and he's really the only Japanese figure whom uh, Oe talks about in this essay, except for his son, of course, too. Whereas Kawabata only spoke about Japanese writers. Owe only speaks about foreign writers. Owe only talks about foreign writers. Uh, very earlier in the essay, he talks about Mark Twain's famous novel, Huckleberry Finn, which is you know, frequently regarded as the greatest American novel. Um, I, I do some push and pull with Moby Dick myself, but you know, hey, Huck Finn is no uh, uh, slouch of a novel and should be uh, highly regarded. Oe also discusses a Swedish novel called Adventures of Nils by a Swedish writer named Selma Lagerlof, right? He says these books, Huckleberry Finn and Adventures of Nils, those are the books that really formed me as a writer. Completely opposite of Kawabata, who refers to early Japanese writers as contributing to Kawabata's uh, sensibilities and literary sensibilities. Owe also puts on a very high pedestal William Butler Yeats, the Irish poet, right? Um, so he talks about so many other cultures and how so many other cultures influenced him and doesn't refer to one, not one Japanese author in this case. And again, I think this all ties back so nicely with his central thesis, which is this internationalist humanism that Oe is trying to uh, put forward here and wants to encourage Japan and the world for that matter. Because after all, giving the Nobel Prize speech for literature, the world is watching you. So he's not just speaking to Japanese viewers, Japanese, Japanese listeners. He's speaking to the world at the Nobel Prize Academy. And he says humanism from all over the world. And Oe makes a conscious effort to pull writers from all over the world in his speech, and yet not one Japanese writer, right? The other way, another way, that Oe counters Kawabata's earlier essay, right, is, of course, that Kawabata, who wrote in 1968, who wrote in 1968, that's more than 25 years after World War II, Kawabata never once, never once in his essay, 
references World War II or talks about World War II. After all, it's quite intriguing for some of us with 2020 hindsight and all to look back from 1968 and Kawabata says, Japan the beautiful and myself. And of course, Kawabata talks about how beautiful Japan is, but then completely ignores. Kawabata completely ignores this little thing called World War II. And I would estimate an ugly blemish on Japanese history. Very ugly blemish. And yet, Kawabata ignores it completely in his own essay. Oe faces World War II head on, and Japan's role in World War II head on, and he engages with it and he acknowledges it and says this was a terrible point of Japanese history, right? He doesn't once talk of Japan in a praiseworthy manner in terms of World War II. Rather, he talks about it as bitter memories, the bitter memories of World War II, and he acknowledges that in front of the world. Whereas more than uh, about 20 years earlier, Kawabata completely ignores World War II, completely overlooks it, despite the fact that Kawabata obviously lived through World War II. Owe engages with it, and he says, this is a problem. This is a problem with Japanese history, with the path that Japan walked in engaging with modernism and modernity. Another way, of course, that uh, uh, Owe challenges or differs from Kawabata's earlier essay is that Owe talks about the present day. He's talking about 1990s Japan. He's talking about 1990s Earth, 1990s humanity, whereas Kawabata's whole essay talks about several hundred years earlier several hundred years earlier, and that's quite, uh, like I said, ignoring and overlooking the modern condition and also recent history and Japan's place in recent history and Japan's place in the global community. Right? Now, the most obvious way that Oe differs from Kawabata is, of course, in the title of the essay. Whereas Kawabata said, Japan the beautiful and myself, Kawabata goes ahead and says, Japan the ambiguous and myself. So what does that word ambiguous mean, at least as Owe uses it? Well, let's go on and start talking about some themes right now. And the obvious aspect of what ambiguity means is the very nature, some would say the essence of the Japanese condition in the modern era, which is this ambiguity between modernity versus tradition. How do we deal with modern, modernity and tradition here? And his thesis is ultimately that Japan has dealt with it in a very ambiguous way. Which way should we go? More traditional or more modern? Well, let's see how Owe engages with this. And right on page 809, Owe really defines or clarifies what he means by ambiguity, right at the top of page 809 here. After 120 years of modernization since the opening up of the country, contemporary Japan is split between two opposite poles of ambiguity. This ambiguity, which is so powerful and penetrating that it divides both the state and the people and affects me as a writer like a deep felt scar, is evident in very ways. The modernization of Japan was oriented toward learning from and imitating the West, yet the country is situated in Asia and has firmly maintained its traditional culture. The ambiguous orientation of Japan drove the country into a position of an invader in Asia and resulted in its isolation from other Asian nations, not only politically, but also socially and culturally. And even in the West, to which its culture was supposedly quite open, 
it has long remained inscrutable or only partially understood. Let me start with that last phrase right there. He's really saying Japan still isn't understood, even to itself. Even to itself, Japan doesn't know itself. That's what ambiguity means. I'm not even sure about myself, Owe suggests. I'm not even sure about Japan, and Japan isn't sure of itself. And certainly there's this discussion about how uh, modernity has contributed to Japan. But look at what Japan did with its modernity. I love that Owe, right here at the top of 809, acknowledges how Japan, later on he'll say, perverted its modernity and its use of modernity. The ambiguous, the ambiguous orientation of Japan drove the country into the position of an invader in Asia. So it sort of, by doing that, it rejects its position in Asia by being the invader of Asia. So Owe interprets history. And doesn't that give Japan a very ambiguous position? Not quite modern, certainly not Western, but not Asian either, since it's the enemy. It's positioned itself as the enemy of Asia. Ask people in China and Korea today. Right? Even today, Japan is dealing with the uh, ramifications of its choices, of Japan's choices, almost 100 years ago, and even over 100 years ago. Is it a Western nation? Certainly not. Is it an Eastern nation? Well, not with this ambiguous nature of it. And so with that in mind, how does Japan maintain traditional culture, traditional Asian culture, in virtue of the fact that it is an enemy, or it's positioned itself, so Owe says, as the enemy of Asia. That creates a very ambiguous and a very uncertain position for Japan to find itself in. And isn't that a problem? When you don't know who you are. When you don't know who you are in the world, what you should do. What is your role in the world? That's going to be a problem for an individual living an individual life, certainly. But isn't it also a problem for a greater nation at large? And so this is going to be always problem that he's trying to engage with. Now later on he's going to try to focus the ambiguity, refocus the ambiguity into something that he calls humanism. But right now he's setting us up to say, look, we're in this ambiguous position, Japan is. And isn't that a problem? Isn't that a problem? He goes even further on page 810. Right in the middle of 810, he says, what I call Japan's ambiguity in this lecture is a kind of chronic disease that has been prevalent throughout the modern age. And isn't it a disease if you don't know who you are and what you shall do? That's going to be a terrible problem. Again, a problem for an individual, but also for a problem, a problem for a nation at large. His response, of course, is humanism. And that's going to be the big theme of this essay. Humanism is going to be the very uh, uh, answer to this ambiguity. How I see, again, West or East, modern or tradition. And always response is going to be, let's bring that together into a humanism. And humanism should be the way forward, should give us the answers as to what Shall we do? Who am I? Where did I come from? And then, of course, what shall we do? Humanism. And focus on this international humanism. So let's see what he means by that. He acknowledges his old professor from Tokyo University, 
Kazuo Watanabe on page 811. This starts. And he says, the late Professor Kazuo Watanabe, scholar of French Renaissance literature and thought, is the one who gives him these ideas. The way Japan has tried to construct a modern state modeled on the West was a disaster. Oe is looking at Japan in the 90s and Japan in modernity and evaluating the whole project as a disaster. The paradigmatic example, the paradigmatic proof of this disaster, of course, is World War II and what Japan did with its modernity in World War II. He's calling it a disaster. First he called it a disease. Now he's calling it a disaster. He really uses the adventures of Nils as the expression of humanism, and he prepares the reader at the very beginning of the essay on page 805 with this notion of humanity and humanism. We'll see right at the bottom of page 805. But my greatest pleasure came from the words Nils uses when he at last comes home, and I felt purified and uplifted as if speaking with him when he says to his parents in the French translation, <laughs> Mama, Papa, je suis grand, je suis de nouveau un homme. Or rather, Mother, Father, I am a big boy. I am a human being again. And right there, Owe reveals to us the direction he wants to go with this essay to focus on humanity, not on Japan, not on Japanese-ness, but on humanity. I am a human being again. And so on page 812, he talks about how Professor Watanabe taught him about humanism. And we'll read at the top, or close to the top of page 812 here. Another way in which Professor Watanabe has influenced me is in his idea of humanism. I take it to be the quintessence of Europe as a living entity. It is an idea that is also explicit in Milan Kundera's definition of the novel. Uh, da, 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 da. I'm skipping a little bit now to the next sentence. By doing so, Watanabe hoped to teach the Japanese about humanism, about the importance of tolerance, about man's vulnerability to his preconceptions and to the machinery of his own making. So there we have three key ideas of the humanism that Owe is trying to put forward. The idea of tolerance, the recognition of vulnerability, human vulnerability. And the recognition also that we're creating, humans are creating this system that we're in. And therefore, we can fix the system that we're in. That's what it implies, of course. Right? And that's the way forward, so Owe proposes to not just Japan, but again, like I said, he's speaking to the Nobel Committee. He's speaking this to the world. This is the way forward for the world to recognize this humanism, to recognize our vulnerability, to preach tolerance, and to recognize that we can make a difference. He recognizes that he is but one in what he calls a brotherhood of world literature, right? For me, the brotherhood of world literature consists of such relationships in positive concrete terms. I once took part in a hunger strike for the political freedom of a gifted Korean poet. I am now deeply worried about the fate of those talented Chinese novelists who have been deprived of their freedom since the Tiananmen Square incident. So he's saying, look at this, I've already fought, I've already moved forward to work for Korean novelists. Let's work for Chinese novelists. And he presumably wouldn't want to stop there either. He'd want to talk about all people around the world who are imprisoned for merely writing. He's talking about China in 1994. However, 
However, this brings to my mind with the future that OWE perhaps predicted, foreshadowed, that in 2010, a Chinese writer, Liu Xiaobo, won the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize, fighting for democracy, fighting for freedom, fighting for liberty and democracy in China. And what happened, of course, in 2010 is that they gave the prize to an empty chair because, of course, China didn't uh, allow Liu to travel to Sweden to pick up his Nobel Peace Prize. Right? So Owe recognizes his role in the world in trying to liberate and free the world, not just Japan, but the world. He says, I fought for Korea. It's interesting in there when he talks about the atomic bombings at the end of World War II. He doesn't just refer to the Japanese suffering of the atomic bombings. He acknowledges, by the way, there were Koreans whom the Japanese had enslaved and brought to Japan as laborers who suffered in the Japanese atomic bombings as well. So it wasn't just Japan who suffered through these atomic bombings in 1945. But look at this, Koreans suffered too. Now this is a big point of contention for many people, right? Especially in Korea, that Japan so frequently talks about, oh, we, Japan suffered so much. Many people in Japan argue, look how bad uh, Japan suffered with the atomic bombings in 1945. We're victims, right? And this victim sort of uh, narrative has, for some folks in Japan, taken over to put aside the, the real history that Japan also instigated so much violence and instigated so much terror around the world in World War II. Oe recognized that. Oe comments upon it. Oe says Koreans suffered in World War II on those uh, two fateful days, on those two days where there were atomic bombings. It wasn't just Japan, Japanese people who suffered. Koreans suffered too. And so he says in that excerpt I just read, I went and fought for Korean writers' freedom. And we should fight for Chinese writers' freedoms too. And by the way, he wouldn't want us to stop there, but all of humanity he would want free under these humanistic goals of tolerance and notion that we can change the world. One thing that I do find very fascinating, right? Now, this is changing the subject quite a bit because now I'm going to talk about the formal structure of the essay. Number one, it's an essay and it's a speech given to the Nobel Prize Academy, right? However, again, like I've said so many times already, he always refers to other writers from other cultures, never referring once to a Japanese writer. But he even uses an Italian phrase on page 807, where he talks about uh, citing the sticker, uh, a translator whom, we, whom I've engaged with, uh, uh, with Tale of Genji and other works. But he uses this Italian phrase that I love. Il traduttore è un traditore. The translator is a traitor. The translator is a traitor. Now this is just, you know, going off a little bit, but I love that phrase. The translator is a traitor. Because that makes me think about how I'm engaging with Japanese literature in general and how Oe engaged with world literature in general. That is, I don't read Japanese very well. I'm reading a lot of these things in English. Many of us are reading these Japanese works in English. Now, Owe says, oh, Simon Sticker, he was not a traitor. He was a good translator. However, why is that? Why does that idiomatic phrase even exist in Italian? Il traditore è un traditore. Because it isn't so much lost in translation. Whenever we read Japanese literature, isn't so much lost in translation. How do we deal with that? How do we engage with that fact that I'm reading so much Japanese literature in translation? 
I'm reading Russian literature. There's Russian literature behind me, French literature, Greek literature behind me, Spanish, German literature behind me. And I read it all in English. How much am I missing when I read it in English instead of its native language, the language it was written in? Well, it's just something that has to keep going and moving around in our minds. And we have to be cognizant of this. Owe leaves side and sticker off and says, ah, oh, he's not a traitor. He translated the tale of Genji so beautifully. Well, I guess. Should I take Owe's word for it though? Right? This question is always and should always haunt us when we read translated literature. However, I think Owe is trying to tell a little bit of a fib that the translator isn't a traitor. He's fibbing about that a little bit. Why though? The fib is for, I think, the greater goal of his humanism. And that's what I love about talking about Japanese literature. It helps me engage with another perspective in the world. It's one thing, I grew up in uh, Los Angeles in America. I live now in New York. I've got a very narrow perspective of things growing up only in the United States. I've got a very American perspective on things, don't I? And so, how do we become more humanistic in this manner? Well, always suggests read worldly literature. Don't be afraid of the Italian threat that the translator is a traitor, but rather engage with these other perspectives and acknowledge my own vulnerability, not just the vulnerability of the human body, but also the vulnerability of the human mind. That is, how wrong can I be? And that's what I love about Owe's essay. He acknowledged how most of modernity went wrong, was a disaster, was a disease for Japan. How wrong it went because they used this uh, uh, poisonous interpretation, this poisonous translation perhaps, this poisonous lack of humanism in engaging with their modernity. And always suggests, how do we balance this? Remember humanism. Remember our vulnerability. Remember to tolerate. And remember that we are the ones who can make the world a better place. And that's why I find it so beautiful that he ends with the anecdote about his son who has autism. He says that his son is innocent. His son with autism has a natural inclination towards innocence. And then he talks about the word innocence. Innocence is composed of in and notere, or not to hurt. Hikari's music was in this sense a natural effusion of the composer's own innocence. As Hikari went on to produce more works, I began to hear in his music also the voice of a crying and dark soul. Handicapped though he was, his hard-won habit of being, composing, acquired a growing maturity of technique and a deepening of conception. That in turn enabled him to discover in the depth of his heart a mass of dark sorrow, which until then he had been unable to express. And at the end of the next paragraph, he says, in this, I find grounds for believing in the wondrous healing power of art. And that's going to be a huge aspect of always humanism. Let's listen to other voices. Let's listen to other perspectives. Even the perspectives of people who might be called mad. Owe had to suffer, and his son had to suffer, being raised in a community that didn't want to raise his son. That might as well just call his son insane. And here, what does Owe say about his son? No, he's not insane. He does have this deep 
feeling in his soul that needs to be expressed and is expressed through his music. And so with that in mind, I think we could just end this discussion today with actually Owe's own words to close out his essay at the end of page 813. I would like to continue to seek with what I hope is a modest, decent, humanistic contribution of my own, ways to be of some use in the cure and reconciliation of mankind. See you next time.